deep rings under her eyes, and extreme tiredness to the point she sleeps for hours during the day. All symptoms of radiation sickness, say nuclear safety experts. If it was just one thing, that would mean it was something else. But all the symptoms came at once. When we left Tokyo for a bit this summer, she got better right away. The gradual sickening of the population is likely unless a major change is affected. Mass evacuation of North Japan and the Kanto Plain, including Tokyo itself, cannot be deemed unreasonable. As yet, no evacuation order has been given. This despite the fact that radiation has cut a huge swath through the small nation state of Japan. The contamination may very well render Japan mostly uninhabitable in the years to come. The irradiation of Japan and the evacuation of its eastern and northern regions that surely must take place has taken on the resemblance of some uniquely Japanese science fiction melodrama, just like an apocalyptic manga or anime plotline that has somehow metaphysically made the leap from the realm of the fantastical into a present-day reality. Fiction has become everyday fact, yet tragically, this has not truly been grasped by a Japanese and wider world public suspended in disbelief that the radiation situation merits urgent evacuation and their gravest concern and vigilance. Not only is the radiation afflicting Japanese people daily, it has gleefully ridden the Pacific jet stream, taking flight to land in North America and breach into all parts of the Northern Hemisphere. One study that was allowed to make the light of day held that 14,000 Americans had died a year after the Fukushima plant meltdown as a result of the travelling radiation. Yet no initiative has been made by the government authorities to warn, prepare or inform Americans or Canadians for the radiation onslaught. In fact, virtually all government radiation devices were switched off in North America. Radiation, of course, carries on its deadly agenda, whether publicly acknowledged or not, in places near and very, very far from Fukushima, Japan. The map I'm going to show you tonight, I'm not making this stuff up. This comes from the Norwegian Air Institute. The reason why the Norwegians are paying attention to this is because back when Chernobyl took place, they got a little bit of the radioactivity that came out of Chernobyl landed in under their country. Here's the west coast. I'm on that little island. I've been saying for a long time, we need to get the heck off. These levels, the yellow levels, is the same thing that's coming out of Japan. So don't think that it's different, it's, it's diluted. Here we go. There's the 9th of May. That's, here's the 5th. The 6th. The 7th. The 8th. The 9th. Here we go, Northern Hemisphere. You can see the yellow over in Japan, right? That's the same yellow that's going to be coming our way. See that yellow right out of Japan? That's what I showed you on the other map. So those of you that, are, that there's people out there saying, no, 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 it's diffused and it's not the same. No, it's the same intensity. And I'm showing xenon gas 133 because it's one of the ones that's the easiest detectable gases, radioactive gases. Our media keeps stressing the less dangerous ones. There's hundreds of radioactive particles that are in this gas, uh, sorry, that are coming out of these reactors. Um, it's just rained, so... Point zero four. <laughs> right, right, well that's what the, um, that's the worst part about it, is it's small little particles, it's not... Anyway, let's go to the drain. Feel it, you know, it's gonna be let's see what happens to it. Number 34, so 37 is about my average. Okay, yeah. It's going way high, oh, that's 10 oh, times. Oh, yeah. Bearing in mind, 300 and... Uh, 70, 340 yeah, is 10 times my background. And this is jet stream. So this what looks like it? all past 20 times. Okay. Here we go. And again. 
This is my water our, scrape. Our measurement is done. Thus we have a worldwide public health time bomb that is primed to explode. The lag from when the radiation poisoning and ingestion occurs to when cancer and leukemia appear could be as early as two to six years. Given the exposure to which millions of Japanese and residents of the Northern Hemisphere have already been subjected, it is for many of them only a matter of time before the cancers manifest themselves. Yet what could explain the inaction and willful ignorance of our entrusted authorities? The United Nations, the IAEA, the World Health Organization, the US government, NATO, and on and on. It is well known that the nuclear industry has long and very powerful tentacles that penetrate into and crisscross through governments, multinationals, and the defense industries. At Chernobyl, the Soviet regime wanted to hush the severity of the accident as it would call into question the legitimacy and prestige of Soviet nuclear power. At Fukushima, we find that the Mark I nuclear reactors were designed by General Electric, who have 23 Mark I reactor plants operating across the United States, and in total has designed 91 nuclear power plants in 11 countries. Despite several engineers resigning decades ago over the design flaws of the Mark I reactor, its design was nevertheless approved for use. A Japanese media official, a week after the earthquake, speaking anonymously, stated, The United States is trying hard to prevent Japan from exposing the role of General Electric Company by exerting too much pressure on Japan. The United States' effort is aimed at preventing further pessimism on behalf of the Japanese people towards the US. General Electric has very strong ties to the military-industrial complex and the US government, and incredibly does not pay taxes in the United States, despite multi-billion dollar annual profits. The IAEA itself admits that it exists in order to promote nuclear power no less. Notably, the Queen of England has 30% of her investments in nuclear energy and uranium mining. A report from Al Jazeera shed light on the money trail that funds the cover-ups of any negative news on the nuclear industry. In the report, David Biello the energy and climate editor at Scientific American Online said that obtaining clear information on incidents such as the Fukushima Daiichi disaster is very difficult. Biello states that there is a lot of secrecy that can surround nuclear power because some of the same processes that can be involved in generating electricity can also be involved in developing a weapon. So there's a kind of veil of secrecy that gets dropped over this stuff that can also obscure the truth. The Nuclear Energy Institute, a policy organization for the nuclear industry with 350 companies, which of course includes TEPCO, has not responded to journalists' requests for information on funding research and chairs at universities. M.V. Ramana, a researcher at Princeton University specializing in the nuclear industry, reveals that most of the funding for nuclear research does not come directly from the nuclear lobby, but from governments who receive donations from the lobby. Ramana continues this by saying, the Department of Energy has a very close relationship with the nuclear industry, and they sort of try to advance the industry's interest. So those people who get funding from that, it's not like they, the researchers, want to lie but there's a certain amount of, shall we say, ideological commitment to nuclear power, as well as a certain amount of self-censorship. It comes down to wondering how the next application for funding might be viewed, he said. A Department of Energy program called Major Areas of Research concerns not only engineering, but also nuclear weapons. As a case in point, the genesis of plutonium and depleted uranium from power plant 
nuclear fission finds its way into weapon systems of the US military. The utilities make money by selling electricity, that's all. They don't have to build the reactors, it's all subsidised and paid for. I mean, no other industry has that sort of subsidisation. And do you know why? Because it's the prodigal son of the weapons industry. And when nuclear power was begun by Eisenhower in the 50s, atoms for peace, the weapons industry said we require nuclear power as a sort of Trojan horse, camouflage to hide behind. And then, and then everyone said it was safe. The Japanese didn't want nuclear power after Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but they were talked into it. Uh, so it's a really wicked, wicked industry. The use of depleted uranium munitions in Fallujah, Iraq, has resulted in contamination and poisoning of civilians and US soldiers. Horrifying birth defects among the offspring of Iraqis and the returning US soldiers and the lack of acknowledgement of this disaster merely hint of a wider and sinister agenda by the US government and the nuclear industry. In Japan itself, an independent report revealed that the Fukushima meltdowns were preventable had the government and TEPCO followed basic safety recommendations. Instead of shoring up emergency power systems, TEPCO successfully fought off any regulations that would cost them money or expose the lack of safety controls at their plants to the public. The report also placed blame on the government for colluding with TEPCO by permitting internal complacency in lieu of official regulations stipulated on the books. Moreover, nuclear plants have been restarted despite hundreds of thousands of Japanese citizens protesting against them. It seems that the government is the nuclear industry, and the nuclear industry is the government. Certainly, this very, very cosy relationship between TEPCO, GE, the United States and Japanese governments, the military-industrial complex, and even international nuclear research academia, plus the intertwining of nuclear engineering and nuclear weapons interests, goes a long way to explaining why any negative news about the reactors and their radiation is strongly suppressed and ridiculed. Instead of focusing on the perils of radiation and taking preventive action, the powers that be seem hell-bent on provoking new disasters. The drums of war and nuclear confrontation in the Middle East are being pounded at this moment. Another towering spectre of radiation has raised its head, that of nuclear war. The United States and NATO are moving inexorably to force regime change in Syria and Iran, partially to protect Israel, a known nuclear weapons power, and the only one in the Middle East. Russia has stipulated that it will intervene if Syria and Iran are attacked by NATO. In the lead-up to the November 2012 elections, the temptation for Barack Obama, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, to wage open war, deploying US troops on a vilified foreign enemy, and have the US public rally around the commander-in-chief may prove too much. The problem is that it just may trigger a hot and nuclear war in the Middle East and escalate globally. If we are to confront this crisis, we will have to deal not only with the ongoing radiation release, but three major shadow points that threaten to escalate the crisis to a possible extinction-level event. Firstly, the three reactor cores from Fukushima Daiichi reactor buildings 1, 2 and 3. After much denial and distortion, it has emerged that all three have been melting through the soil and ground beneath the building since March 12, 2011. This is what is dubbed China Syndrome, where a super-hot melted-down reactor core penetrates the floor of its building and bores and burns its way into the ground below all the way to China, metaphorically, contaminating the soil and water table. 